On today's episode of Work Trends, we're talking about the dangerous gaps that could put your business at risk. Today's episode is sponsored by PosterGuard. Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Bureau. Every week, we interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And join us on Twitter every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, using the hashtag WorkTrends. Guess what, everyone? Today, we're talking about labor law, the important regulations that HR leaders need to know. Before I dive in with today's guest, let's take a deeper dive at a series of laws regarding a topic I'm always kind of checking out, equal pay. There are federal bills that are literally stuck in the Senate, including the Paycheck Fairness Act. But the good news is we are seeing forward progress on pay equality. Eleven states have a pay equality law going into effect this year. So that's cool, right? Bloomberg Law has a great map that shows you where these laws are rolling out. The states impacted are all across the country from Hawaii to Alabama. So that's pretty cool. Let's dig deeper on the labor laws you need to know with today's guest. Shanna Wall is a compliance attorney, kind of fancy, huh? At Poster Guard. Welcome to Work Trend, Shanna. Thank you, Megan. Thanks thanks for having me today. You got it. Where are you calling in from? I am in near Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Oh, sweet. Yes. Rumor has it you didn't get much sleep last night. Is that right? Oh, I haven't been getting sleep for about five and a half months now. I got a newborn at home, so. Nice. (laughs) Thank you. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Every (laughs) sleepless minute. (laughs) Nice. Well, we're excited you're here. I'd love to hear a little bit about your background first. How did you get interested in employment law? Oh, wow. Okay. Well, um, I guess it really kind of started with my first legal job as a law clerk. At my first firm that I worked for, uh, we handled some FLSA claims and I did a lot of the uh, legal research on the topic. As a clerk, that's kind of what you do, a lot of research. Uh, And then I'd say my interest kind of expanded when I became a small business owner. I had my own firm, so I really had to pay attention and understand employment and labor law issues, you know, from the FLSA side, but also even down to the minute details that you would find in handbooks, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though our law firm, you know, focused on contracts and property damage issues, actually running the business and handling those employment issues was really my favorite part of being a small business owner. Really? Yeah. I Are know. you being serious with us? Because I'm like, I there's am. so many other things. Yeah, no, that, I know. I like the administrative side of it. I, <laughs> I know. Well, listen, Poster Guard recently put out a list of 10 dangerous gaps that could put your business at risk. What are some of those gaps that are top of mind for you? I know you've got a whole bunch of things here. Oh, yeah. That, that, That list of 10 was really good, Um, but I think three really come to my mind. First and foremost, I would say uh, focusing only on those federal and state level postings. And the reason why this one's top of mind for me is because we are seeing more and more city and county level posting requirements. Um, Some mandatory postings at the city level include topics like uh, your minimum wage, anti-discrimination, sexual harassment, fair chance, there's a bunch, living wage, and sick and leave law, for example. And employers have to post the city and county level posters along with any of their mandatory uh, federal and state level as well. So this is true even if you would think that the posters conflict with each other, for example, like with the minimum wage posters. Chances are if you're in in an area that has three different minimum wage posters, your federal and then your state and then your local, that they're all going to be three different numbers. But you have to post all three, even though the highest number is the one that's actually going to be applicable to that employer. Okay, you just said two words that are standing out to me, fair and chance. What is this? Talk to our audience about it. You know, fair chance, you know, there's different types of fair chance, but a lot of laws now are these ban the box laws that we're seeing. A lot of those are called the fair chance laws as well. But those mostly have to do with job applications, for example, that employers can't ask about criminal history until point in the application process. For example, you can't ask it on a a job application. You can't ask it in a job interview until you actually make a conditional offer. 
so those are a lot of the fair chance ones. But there's, you know, there's different different versions of it, but that's kind of the gist of it. And does that matter state by state? Or is this U.S.? Or talk to us about how where you live affects some of the stuff. Yeah, well, where you live is going to affect all these laws, really. You know, federal is just kind of your baseline laws, but then state and local levels really get down to the nitty gritty. And they actually expand in areas where your federal laws aren't really covering right now, especially, I'm sure we'll get into it later, like paid sick leave laws, things like that. Well, let's talk a little bit about remote work because we're all moving in that direction rapidly. Rapidly. What do HR leaders need to know about being in compliance when their workers aren't in the office? Remote work, you know, obviously that's a very popular trend and we're seeing many factors actually contributing to this trend, such as, you know, your changing workforce and the use of technology, for example. But the posting requirements are actually remaining the same. The laws here are going to require that you notify all employees of their rights, and that includes um, employees who work remotely. So all employees have to have access to mandatory notices and postings. And I'm not just talking posters, but there's also uh, mandatory uh, notifications that you have to provide in written form to your employees as well. And it gets confusing for employers on actually how to provide these uh, notices to your remote workers. So the DOL, the Department of Labor, has recently clarified that the electronic postings are compliant solutions for remote workers if they have computer access. And they even further clarify that employees who come into the office less frequently, say three or four times a month or less, um, should have those posters provided to them in an alternate format, such as the electronic posters. So the bottom takeaway here, I would say if if you do have remote workers that don't come into your office or barely come into your office, you need to make those notices available via email or internet in some kind of electronic format that can be be accessed by your employees if they have that computer. So as a best practice, I would also track their acknowledgements um, that they have received those um, notices. So you have proof that the employees were actually provided access to those postings. I'm not hearing mobile phones in this equation. Talk to us about mobile and how it plays into some of those. If you send your postings via email, then obviously you can open those through your phone as well. But it's basically just electronic formats. Okay, so that includes what? What? How, how do we? How are you defining electronic? Well, it's just going to be, you know, like you would send it through like a PDF or something. Um, you could even have it like if they have access to like an internet uh, company site, things like that. And it doesn't matter what size organization you are for some of these laws around remote work. Right. If the employees are required to get the notice, they have to get the notice, and that's not going to depend on the size of your employer of the employer. Yeah. Cool. And I'm I've got a couple of people asking me. They're whispering in my ear, poster guard. Why the name? How does this relate to your business? What we try to do is protect the uh, employer and keep them in compliance. That's that's our number one goal. And so, you know, we're guarding you in, in compliance. And obviously, the bulk of our business is uh, providing these posters. And again, like I said, also, we're adding those mandatory handouts. We have services for those as well. But basically, our goal is to keep all employers in compliance and keep up to date with the latest requirements that they may have, whether that's federal, whether that's state or city and local. So you're pretty busy, huh? Oh, I'm swamped. <laughs> <laughs> very, very busy. And do you just work in the U.S. or globally? Oh, uh, we handle um, the U.S. territories and we also do uh, a little bit of postings for Canada as well. So you you know what's coming next. If you're out there in the audience and you're on Twitter or Instagram or wherever you're tuning in to being social these days, we know there's been a lot of conversation lately about social media at work. How much employers can control or monitor what you're saying on social media? So what do we need to know about social media and the law right now, like as of today? Because I know things are continuing to evolve. Yeah. Well, what I would say is employers really need to get to know the NLRB's position on this. That's the nation, uh, National Labor Relations uh, Relation Board, because they're really the ones that are guiding these social media policies uh, right now. Um, so what employers might see as a common sense social media policy that, you know, where they're trying to protect their company's reputation and confidential information can actually violate uh, an employee's Section 7 rights, and the NLRB has ruled against several employers' social media policies for actually being too broad and chilling the employees' legally protected speech. The board has held the position that a social media policy is unlawful if it can reasonably uh, be construed to interfere with rights under the NLRA. 
But recently, like you said, we've got to keep apprised of this because it seems that the NLRB is actually softening their position a little bit, um, as they are with some of their other their other rules as well. But now they're looking to make it a little bit more employee uh, employer friendly by weighing the legitimate employer's justifications for the reason for those policies against any potential restrictions on the uh, employee's NLRA rights. So, you know, what I would say for employers that are wanting to to in- install some of these policies, really give as much detail and context and examples of whatever communications that you're prohibiting, because you want to show that your scope is limited and not too overbroad. And I, you know, some employers might think, you know, just putting a simple disclaimer at the end of their policy that it's not intended to prohibit communications that might be uh, protected. Just be aware that that might not be enough to actually save an unlawful policy. So you want to be as specific and clear in your clause as well. Okay, so I think the audience probably right now wants to hear some case studies from you. Can you give us some some real life examples? You certainly don't have to name names if you're not comfortable. Why are they starting to soften on this a little bit in your opinion? Honestly, I don't really have any case studies other than, you know, like the um the NLRB like releases some general counsel memos and, you know, they actually tell you like what company's policy says and and why they deemed it unlawful. So without actually having having, you know, those in front of me, I don't have them off the top of my head. But I I think that we're seeing them soften because with the change of administration, then obviously you're getting the change uh, of the political party into the NLRB as well. And I think that's where you're seeing some of the shifts are becoming more pro-employer across the board here, uh, whether that's the Department of Labor or the NLRB. So I think that's where we're seeing the the softening come from. And you're saying this has really happened since Trump has been in office? Yeah, I would say it's definitely an administrative uh, shift in priorities. Is there a social media platform that you think is particularly, I don't know the right word, dangerous for employers? Uh, I mean, I think any of them could be, but obviously Twitter, because with those, you know, the short number of characters, it could get mm-hmm. people in trouble. <laughs> you you hit send without thinking. So, you know, those are things you have to be on the lookout for. Yeah, for sure. And do you use social media yourself? Very, very little. Uh Uh-huh. Why am I not surprised by that answer? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I keep it strictly to mostly friends and family that, you know, want to see pictures of my children. Got it. Okay. And do you (laughs) consider, I, I, I had this conversation with somebody else earlier this week. I am wondering, LinkedIn... Do you see that from your POV? Number one, are you using it? Number two, some people consider LinkedIn to be social media. Do you? I would say LinkedIn is definitely social media. I mean, you're connecting with other people in in an environment, but obviously it's more business oriented, but... It's def- I would definitely consider that social media, yes. Yeah, because there's still people saying kind of stupid, silly stuff there, huh? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, I don't see it too often because I think most people try to keep it pretty professional on there. Uh-huh. You're not on my LinkedIn then. I Because uh- <laughs> it's the Wild West. I'm like, wow, you said that? <laughs> yeah, no, a lot of a lot of minor business owners that uh that I'm connected with, so yeah. So we want to hear about brand new regulations. What's popping? What are some changes that employers might not realize right now? Oh, well, I would, you know, I would start with discrimination and harassment laws. We're seeing a lot more regulations based on having to train your employees. So we're seeing like states like California and Connecticut, they've already have some training requirements, but what we're seeing for them is they're actually reducing the number of employees, uh, like the threshold. Um, so it covers more employers and more employees. So for example, the current law in California is employers with 50 or more have to uh, train supervisors. Well, now they're, they've changed the law to going forward. Um, they're going to have to employer employers with five or more employees instead of 50 or more actually are going to have to train all of their employees, not just their supervisors. So that's some trends that we're seeing and they have to, you know, give written policies in some places. And we're even seeing that down at like the city level, like New York city, for example, that they have their own um, discrimination and harassment uh, requirements for training and policies and things like that. New York actually, um, New York and California, two big states, of course, are actually leading the way on a new trend um, that I see maybe taking off. And that's prohibiting discrimination based on hairstyles. Really? Uh, Yeah. So what they're doing is basically redefining their protected class of race to include traits historically associated with race, such as um, hair texture and protective hairstyles. Uh, We're also seeing that in New York as well with religion. Now you cannot discriminate based on 
religious attire and facial hair. Um, if you have the facial hair for religious reasons, things like that. Those laws are brand new and not, I don't know that they're fully implemented yet, but they're definitely um, really close to, to being effective on that. Uh, we're also seeing paid time off. I'm sure a lot of people have heard, you know, I have paid sick days or I've got, my state's got paid family and medical leave. But now we're actually seeing a couple states take off with paid time off for any reason. Meaning what? Meaning, hey, it's a sunny day. I want to go to the beach. I've got so many days of paid time off. I'm going to take one. And those two states are uh, Nevada and Maine, actually. Um, oh, really? And those, yeah, those laws are going to huh. go into effect in 2020 and 2020. 2021, respectively. So that might be something we see take off as well. Oh, and then, of course, smoking. Making the national headlines right now are all these vaping deaths. I think last count, we're up to like six, six maybe. And growing. Yeah. And so some states, and even before these made national headlines, we were seeing a lot of smoking laws starting to include vaping and the use of e-cigarettes um, inside the workplace. They're they're banning those inside the workplace. Um, Already. So they're, get- so they're getting ahead yeah. of it. Yeah, and th- they started that before the, this actually started making national news. But I think we're going to now we're going to see even more and more states take over on that. And then, of course, the m- medical marijuana, too. They're starting to they're starting to incorporate that into their no smoking laws as well. Shanna, what states are leading the way around vaping? Uh, well, a lot of states actually, like I said, have already started including it. I know um, recently even Oklahoma included, I think, they changed some of their laws there. And then Florida has uh, added e-cigarettes as well. I don't know the other ones off the top of my head. There's so many laws. It's hard to keep track of which states have which. There you go. Uh, You're busy. Yeah, but I know I just updated Oklahoma. Oklahoma might actually have been one um, on the medical marijuana one. I'd have to double check on that as well. But what is it stating around medical marijuana specifically? They're they're basically just saying that you uh, you can't smoke it in the workplace <laughs> is, is the gist of it, it just, can you eat no it? smoking bans can we do uh, edibles in states that actually have medical or recreational legalization of it it would probably be up to the employer to make their policies what they want to do unless there's some other kind of ban that they might be applicable such as if it's a security position of some sort things like that that re- require an absolute no uh, drug policy and even in the states, some employers still have a, a total drug free workplace just because of like uh, workers comp laws and things like that. If they want to get like workers comp discounts and things that might actually be required as well. So, Shanna, as we look ahead into 2020, what are your predictions about how the law around employment will change? I don't know so much as change. But like continue, for example, I, th- I really think we're going to continue to see more state and local laws being passed especially with the when the federal laws are remaining unchanged for the most part. And that's with your, your minimum wage, your paid time off, things like that. And I, and I think that's really going to cause nightmare for these larger employer employers that especially have employees in different locations, whether it's different states or even different cities. Because, for example, take Texas. They have three cities that passed some paid um, sick leave. I know some some of them are actually being held off right now because they're being fought in the courts. But that potentially they could have three different cities. So if your employer has employees in those three different cities, you're going to have to know all three of those laws. And that, you know, is going to be the same across the board, like if you're talking minimum wage, all those kinds of things. So it really causes a nightmare for employers to, to stay up, up to date on all of those requirements. And let me just ask you this, and it doesn't matter if you're remote or not in that instance? So it's going to depend on how the actual law is written, because some laws are going to say employees in this state or, you know, so for example, if you have a a company that's out on the East Coast, your headquarters are in the East Coast, but you have a remote worker in California, most of California laws are probably going to apply to that remote worker in California. It's going to be very specific to how the law is actually written. So you're going to have to pay attention to that. So it's, you know, it's kind of hard for me to say across the board, absolutely, it's going to apply. But you really have to pay attention to actually how the laws are written on those. Shanna Wall, thanks for stopping by today. This has been super informative. No problem. Thanks for having me. I really had uh, had a good time. Let's keep this conversation moving. Join us for our Work Trends Twitter chat. We'll be on the Twitters with Shanna Wall and Poster Guard on Wednesday, September 25th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific. Join us to talk about some of the thorniest compliance issues in the workplace. You're not going to want to miss this one. If you'd like to get our Twitter chat questions in advance, sign up for our newsletter at talentculture.com. Thanks. 
Thanks to listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, in iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.